Hey guys, welcome back. So today we are out at the range with the M&M Industries M10X Z, Z is for Zukov Furniture from Magpul. This is a rifle that I've been dabbling with for several years. When the rifle first came out, I met with the guys at M&M Industries at SHOT Show and they sent out a rifle for T&E. The gun didn't work, it wouldn't function properly, it wouldn't cycle a full magazine without a malfunction. We tried the different gas settings, tried different ammunition, wound up sending the rifle back to them. They sent, uh, later they sent a second t &E sample, test and evaluation sample, and once again we ran into functional issues and sent the rifle back, gosh, probably about seven months ago, and so they promised they would send an updated version. And that version never came. Uh, they went radio silent after we returned the second version of the gun. And so I've had a, an interest in it because in essence, this is a SIG 550 chambered in 762 by 39. If you go back in my videos, you'll know that I was giving SIG chances when they had the 556R, the XIR, uh, their, their version of the 55 or the 550, they called it the 556. Uh, when they were chambering them in the Russian caliber, they called them R for Russian the guns never worked. SIG couldn't get them working at all. Well, when I saw this thing come onto the market, I thought, well, maybe a third party had solved the problem. And this gun is that. This is, at its core, a SIG 550, and we'll show you that later in this video. And just in sighting it in, we've had good luck so far with Tula and Wolf ammunition. We've had no malfunctions. As a matter of fact, the gun seems to be shooting quite well. So in this video, this is a first shots video. We've just for the first time brought it out to the range today, and we're gonna put three or 400 rounds through it. Some folks online have said they've experienced broken firing pins right around the three, four, 500 round mark. We're gonna see if we can get to that point in our round count today, see if we break a firing pin, but hopefully that doesn't happen. I really like the way this gun shoots. Uh, it's a little bit heavy. It tips the scales at about seven pounds, 13 ounces. So it's almost eight pounds, and right now it's farming season. So that's a combine making all the noise in the background. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's big, it's heavy, it's all metal, but I like the way it looks and I like the concept of a 550 and 762 by 39. We have a primary arms optic on top. We will be swapping this out later. It's a 556 optic with a BDC for a 556, but we've got it zeroed and uh, they do make a 762 by 39 version of this, which we'll be putting on later, but we do have it zeroed. And so let's try doing a little bit of shooting out at uh, 150, yeah, let's just go right to 200 yards. has a very, very good trigger on it. It's a really, really a smooth shooting rifle. All right, let's get further into this video and take a closer look at the M10XZ. Guys, please swing by and check out Big Daddy Unlimited BDU. They help support us here at the Military Arms Channel with products and things like that so we can continue to bring you content. There's a link in the video description down below that'll take you to the Mac blog and website please follow that link and from there you'll find a link to Big Daddy Unlimited and try them out just for 99 cents. You can see what they're all about. In essence, they're just like a big online store that has amazing prices. So please again, check out BDU. Let's take a look inside the box and see what comes with the M10X. When you first open the box up, you're gonna find that there's this cardboard piece in here, the clam shells. So it's fairly well protected, which is a good thing. Uh, you can tell that the charging handle was originally on the other side, so it did still poke through, but it didn't make it all the way through the box like so many boxes do for AKs. There's the rifle. You'll have one 30-round X-Tech magazine that has this OEM 47 sticker on the side, but it is an X-Tech magazine. We've tested these, and they're actually really good magazines. And then your owner's manual, which looks like it's uh, something that they printed themselves, but it has color photos, 
and seems to be very detailed. Breaks down everything from the gas system to, you know, everything. So that is what is in the box when you get your new M10X. Let's kind of go over the features of the M10X. So starting off back here, we have a Zukov stock that has uh, been set up to work with this rifle. And that gives it the ability to push this button and fold the stock alongside the rifle. And yes, the gun will function with the stock folded. In the rear, we have the button that you can use to take the weapon apart. You can also access it from a port that's been cut here should you want to for whatever reason try to disassemble the gun with the stock extended you can stick a tool up in there and push the button. Uh, it's a lot easier just to push the button with the stock folded which then hinges the firearm open for disassembly. Then we have the safety then the, the safety is present on both sides of the firearm. It's very AR-15 in, in design, but not quite the same location, but it is easy to get to. And I find myself when I'm shooting for groups, holding the weapon like this, using that safety, which is in a really good position for that type of shooting without using the thumb over grip. Not that this gun's capable of supreme accuracy, but you know, Sometimes it's nice to shoot that way from the bench. Moving forward, we have the charging handle. The charging handle can be easily removed. To remove it, you push in, there's like a little J hook on the other side. We'll try to get a picture of it to show you here, but you push in, turn it until it stops, and then the charging handle can come out. I don't know if Jason can zoom in, but you can see that little J hook this would be in the locked position so you can't take it apart, push in and turn, and that releases it so you can remove it. Locked, and so you can remove it. Now, to put it in the other side, you just push it through, turn that little hook, and it's in place. Now, this has gone through a number of different evolutionary changes. Previous rifles we've had, you'd use the tip of a bullet to push it in, and it would have like a little detent, then you could pull it out. Other, then you had a knob on the end that you could just push without a tool, and now we've come to this J-hook design, which I think is the latest because there was an addendum stuck into the uh, owner's manual talking about this new J-hook system. So I like to run the gun like an AK, so I run it on this side of the firearm. Speaking of an AK, you have an open system here where the charging handle can reciprocate during firing. On the opposite side of the firearm, you have an opening for the charging handle to operate as well. That leaves the action of the gun completely open to the ingress of dirt and debris. So if you're gonna do a gauntlet test on something like this, stuff's just gonna flow right, on the, right through these openings, right into the trigger mechanism of the gun. So I, I wouldn't recommend um, you know, rolling around the sand with this particular rifle. Across the top here, we have a monolithic 1913 rail. It does appear as though this aluminum upper slides over a steel insert inside here. We're not going to take the gun apart, but it just looks like there's two separate components. On the bottom, we have a stamped sheet metal lower, and inside we have an AK style trigger mechanism, which I'll show you here really quickly. You can see the AK style trigger mechanism. Now, if you take a look at the hammer, you're going to notice 
some pretty heavy wear on that hammer and that's coming from just firing it. It would appear that the bolt is harder than the hammer, therefore it's really scalloping that hammer pretty badly. And that's within just maybe 200 rounds or so. So we're gonna keep an eye on that. You have this hinge point up here, it takes flathead screwdriver to take it apart. Um, I wouldn't do that, you can just hinge it open to clean it. On the underside, we found this screw and looking through the receiver, it looks like the screw butts up against the barrel for some reason. It does look like the barrel screws into the front trunnion. Why this screw is here and why it's pressing on the bottom of the barrel, I don't know. We're not going to take it apart to find out. Moving forward, we have the gas system. And the gas system is set up, you should be able to turn it probably with the tip of a bullet to get extra leverage or you can push down on the detent, which makes it a little bit easier. But the gas system has two primary settings. And you have primary setting one, which has a little arrow that points to it. There's a zero, but no detent for the zero that I can find. There's a zero and then there's a two. So it'll click there. There's a zero position in the middle with no detent and then there's one. So they say the zero is to shut the gas off. There's no detent for it. It just goes from one to two for me, which is fine because I don't understand why you'd want to shut your gas system off on a rifle like this anyway. But if we take the gas plug out, you're going to see you have a primary gas port. This is your secondary gas port, which is for adverse conditions, which would be setting number two. And then if you go around to the other side, we have three settings and three detents right here. We have three different settings for suppressor use. And it says in the owner's manual, it's not marked on the face of the gas tube uh, with these three settings, but they are there and they're for use with suppression. Suppression. It doesn't go any, into any detail in the owner's manual. It just says for more information or for assistance, contact the manufacturer for using these three gas settings for suppression. And you can see how easy it is to take the gas system apart. You wanna make sure that the arrow is pointing down. If you turn it around all the way, this will go to the gas settings for suppression. There's one, one, two, let's see, one, two, three, and I went right past it, and three for the gas, gas settings for suppression. All right, and then out here on the end, we have the muzzle device they've put on their AKs and the M10X, which is a flash suppressor and muzzle brake, I think. It seems to be fairly effective because the gun has very mild recoil. Coming back here, we have a standard AK mag release, which is just a simple flapper. And then we have this pistol grip, which seems to be something they've made for themselves. Uh, it, it's actually pretty nice feeling pistol grip. Both Jason and I like the pistol grip quite a bit. And then in the pistol grip, you can pull the inside of it out. And I'm guessing that's for a cleaning kit that wasn't in the box or something. Batteries maybe. But you have that storage in the pistol grip. Then of course, out here on the rails, we have M-Lock. These are standard M-Lock rail sections and you have them on the bottom as well. This is the magazine it ships with. Click no bang. Let's see what we got. Yeah, that looks like a solid hit on the primer. Let's see if we can get it together the second time around. Now it has been said these things break firing pins. Let's hope that's not what's happening here. Probably not. Now, second try it went off.
think we got ourselves a malfunction. That is the first malfunction of the day. And that's with its OEM magazine. Grab that round and try it again. That's not good. Oh no, I lost it. Imagine that. This ground is so pristine. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Kidding, of course, because this ground is covered in spent cases. Not good. Yep, gas regulator set to its standard setting. That is the one and only malfunction we've had so far, but it shouldn't be having any. Another light primer strike. This is Golden Tiger. That's a solid hit. The gun should be set up to fire steel cased ammunition, which has notoriously heavy primers. But that's the second light primer strike. Once with Wolf, I believe, and now with Golden Tiger. Reload the round, see if it'll go off on the second attempt. Another light primer strike. This is Golden Tiger. We found one and a half boxes of it in the Polaris. And once again, light primer strike. This is Russian military standard ammunition. It's lacquer coated, sealed. So this is the good stuff. Second try on that dead round. Another light primer strike. So it will not cycle Golden Tiger or Russian military service ammo or the equivalent of. That's not a good sign. I've never had a problem with Golden Tiger cycling in any of my AKs. It's telling me that, uh, yeah, you know, again, light primer strike. So we're going to shift away from the Golden Tiger. And we'll move over to some Federal. We found some of this as well. Let's see how the Federal does. Ah, get out of there. Okay, don't know if I'm out of ammo. Nope. Failed to go into battery. What do we got here? Some type of malfunction. Let's see what we got. Okay, the bolt is stuck. 
All right, gonna have to mortar this, guys. When you do this, keep your face away from the muzzle. Wow, something's wrong. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, that solved the problem. <laughs> All right, so what do we have here? Well, something about the chamber, I'm gonna guess. So we don't see this all that often. The, the round that fired before this one split and left the neck in the chamber. When this one chambered, it forced itself into the neck and that's why it didn't fully seat. And then when I extracted it, it pulled the, the split, split case out of the chamber. So, I'm guessing it doesn't like brass cased ammunition, so avoid that. And it doesn't like heavily primed ammunition like Golden Tiger. Things started off so well this morning and so rapidly went south. This is my PSA AKM. It's in 7.62x39. You've seen it many times here on the channel before. It has an RS Regulate mount on it and a primary arms red dot sight. And this is easily one of my favorite AKs to shoot. This is the Golden Tiger that the, uh, that the M10X could not ignite. Just gonna show you that AKs run this ammo just fine. So, no issues with the Golden Tiger out of an AK. All right, guys, so we're gonna take the rest of that Federal ammunition that was having problems in the M10X and run it out of the PSA AKM. We shot a lot of groups out here this afternoon. The groups I'm gonna show you are gonna be representative of what we came to expect from the various types of ammunition that we have out here today. We have Tula, Wolf, and Barnul. So the first target we're gonna take a look at here, this is with the Wolf 123 grain at 100 yards. And it's a 2.3 inch group. Down here we have a four inch group with the 124 grain Tula. Again, all these groups are from 100 yards. On this target, two shooters. So the top target would be Jason. I shot the bottom group. So up top here, we have Wolf 123 grain, a 2.1 inch group. Two shots went to the same hole here. And down here, we have a 2.3 inch group with the same Wolf ammunition. So very consistent performance across two different shooters. Oh, we're gonna save this one for last. The Bernoul, six inches. One round here, up here in the optics planet, one down over here, and then the rest. Definitely didn't like the Bernoul, and that was consistently, it didn't like it. Here's a 1.8 inch group I shot with the Wolf, five shot. So again, right around that two inch group size with Wolf at 100 yards, which is actually very good performance. And then this one. So this is where we get into the oddness of the gun and the weird behavior. So this is with Tula. We had a three shot group going and then we had a wild flyer here and one that almost went off the paper. Wasn't the shooter, Jason and I both have experienced this and it isn't with just any one type of ammunition. It's with all of them. The gun will for whatever reason 
start shooting a nice group, and then out of the blue, a wild shot. That, I mean, it's the worst type of flyer you've ever seen before. So much so it will miss a man-sized target at 100 yards. So you'll have two, three, four shots grouping, and then you'll have a shot that goes completely off the steel plate or off the paper. And again, that happened across all the different ammunition types that we had out here this afternoon. So we tried to start figuring out what might be causing it. So we opened the video with the primary arms optic on here, and we thought, well, and we kept checking everything, making sure it's tight, barrel's tight. We couldn't find anything wrong with the barrel. The barrel screws into the receiver. It's, it's nice and tight. The mount to the receiver's tight. The scope's tight in the, the mount. Couldn't figure it out. So we took this scope off, put a trigicon on here that we commonly use for testing, and we saw the exact same behavior with the trigicon, using a different mount and a different scope. So it's, uh, it's unpredictable. We don't know what causes it. And again, it happens across all different ammunition types. So when the gun's shooting, it really seems to like this wolf, but be prepared for some really wild flyers, at least in case in the case of this particular rifle. Maybe a different rifle won't do that. So we tried to figure out what was causing it and we couldn't figure it out. So this afternoon we've had, you know, kind of the ups and downs. We saw some pretty darn good accuracy. The tightest group of the day was 1.8 inches with wolf. It definitely seems like the wolf ammunition. So some of the problems we ran into is uh, with different types of ammunition, including the wolf, we saw wild inaccuracies. It'll be shooting a nice tight group, and then for whatever reason, it'll throw one way off into space. But it definitely seemed to minimize that with the wolf ammunition. Seems like right around two inches about the average for a five shot group at 100 yards with the wolf ammunition, which again is pretty good. Then we went to Golden Tiger. I'm glad I found some of that because we wouldn't have discovered that problem. The Golden Tiger, heavily primed, sealed, lacquered, Russian military ball, classic Russian military ball. It would not fire it. Got light primer strikes. We even saw light primer strikes with other types of ammunition. And then we actually had a malfunction with Wolf. So overall, the performance of the gun looked promising in the beginning. As time went on, we started to find the malfunctions. We tried changing up the ammo type. We even had a brass case split, left the neck in the chamber. Then the next round, thankfully, pulled that uh, stuck case split case out of the chamber for us. I mean, it was just not impressed with the ammunition situation. It seems to like one type of ammunition only. And if you venture too far away from that, you're either gonna get light primer strikes, you're gonna get split cases, weird behavior. Now that doesn't mean all the guns are gonna experience that, but this one does. Another thing that we noticed has to do with the hammer. So if you take a close look at this hammer, that sucker is getting beat up pretty badly. Now we fired about 400 rounds this afternoon. Uh, we didn't break the firing pin, but that hammer looks like it's been hit with a bastard file. If I take the bolt out and show you the rear of the carrier here, if you take a look at the rear of the carrier, you have a pretty sharp angle there. It's not rounded like a regular AK, and it seems like maybe that is, and this must be harder than the hammer, and that's just chewing the heck out of the hammer in there. Now, how long will it do that, and will it eventually get to the point where it prevents the gun from functioning? I don't know, that's pure speculation, but that does not look good, so that's a bit concerning as well. So when you take a look at the price of the gun, and it's mediocre performance, with different types of ammunition. Really good accuracy, I do like that. Uh, the ergonomics, spot on. Both Jason and I find shooting the gun to be very pleasant, recoils very mild. But when you're taking a look at a $1,300 gun, I would take a look at other alternatives on the market and just get myself an AK. The PSA AK is a fraction, about half the price of this thing. You can get one of the new KR-103s they're gonna release in November for right around $1,000. This thing costs $1,300 and seems to be a little bit finicky. It's a little bit finicky with magazines, a little bit finicky with ammunition. Yeah, not all that impressed. I'm gonna keep shooting the gun, I own it. Uh, we did get those two t &E samples in before we had malfunctions regularly with them. We've only had a couple of failures here, one malfunction, one split case, and a number of light primer strikes. But um, yeah, just not impressed for the amount of money that they're asking for the gun. Guys, if you'd like to be, for us to be able to continue to bring you honest information like this about firearms like the M10X, 
please consider becoming part of our Patreon family. There's a link in the video description below. We're not paid by the gun companies like M&M Industries. We're supported by you, our viewing audience. Click that link and become part of our Patreon family and you get special content over there. Also, right here underneath the video player that you're watching right now, there's a little join button. Click that join button and support us right here on YouTube. And last but not least, guys, please swing by and check out coppercustom.com. Thank you for 12 years of support. We'll talk to you guys soon.